remote speck in the Indian Ocean. Christmas Island. November brings the monsoon rain. The remarkable red crab of Christmas Island is suddenly invigorated. In the island's rainforest, these land-dwelling crabs have been living solitary lives, preparing for this moment. With the rain, they leave their burrows to begin a journey. They're hormonally primed to reproduce, but they can't do it here. They need the ocean, so they're compelled to march from the forest to the sea. They're driven by an instinct which synchronizes their mating ritual with a special tide at the third quarter of the moon. It's an epic migration, over a dozen kilometers, taking up to a month there and back. On this scale, it happens nowhere else in the world. And news just a hand. It looks as though last night's showers have done the trick. The first crabs of the season have been spotted leaving the jungle. All we need now is a good downpour and the circus will be on its way to town. There are around 120 million crabs on the march. The residents can love them or loathe them, but they can't ignore them. They flow like a crab river. They navigate the same pathways year after year. Nothing deters them. What's more, they know how far they have to travel and how long they've got. It seems they're locked into the phases of the moon. For just over a century, crabs have had to share their island. During migration, the human inhabitants just have to adapt and often patch their tires. For the islanders, Encounters with crabs during the migration are just part of island life. If you open up the back door, open your front door, you'll see these crabs just go from the back straight to the front door. It's just such a normal part of, of being on Christmas Island. Most of the time we just work around the crabs and take them for granted. No, we're all some well, on God's earth, that you can play here and have these little red creatures around the ball. They're a particular problem when you're putting. Oh, lovely shot, Victor. Didn't quite get there. spectacle of crabs may be threatened. Their migration is facing a new kind of predator. Max Orchard manages the national park. Two years ago, he began to notice that crabs were disappearing from parts of the forest. It's still pretty dry down here, huh? Yeah, it certainly is. I happen to be travelling through that area and I was expecting to see these crabs popping out of burrows everywhere and there just weren't any crabs. The crabs that were out and about just weren't behaving as crabs normally do. They were particularly sluggish. Some were in fact dead and it became immediately evident that, uh, that we had a problem on our hands. The 
island is frequently visited by research biologists. Dennis O'Dowd and his colleagues were about to discover the beginnings of an ecological disaster. I started coming to Christmas Island uh, to study what red crabs do in rainforest. What is their role in the forest? When you work with anything, any sort of organism, you come to know them. They're kind of like old friends after a while. It's always a pleasure to return to the island and the unique sounds and smells. I've always thought it's uh, like walking into an alien world. In 1997, we were out here on one of our routine annual uh, research trips to the island. One day, we were setting up a transect. And on this transect, we count the crabs and uh, try to take measures of their abundance to see whether the patterns we're seeing there are similar to uh, our other sites. When we moved into the forest, all of a sudden, ants started boiling up on our legs. We'd never seen this phenomenon before. It was a startling event. At the time, we couldn't put this together. Ants, dead crabs. Slowly, uh, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle uh, started to fit in. But what was clear was the ants were killing the crabs. Anaplelepis chrysilipes, or the yellow crazy ant, is an exotic invader originating from Africa. They probably arrived as stowaways in ship's cargo sometime between 1915 and 1934. Like most island invaders, the ant's presence was undetected for many years. Dennis quickly learned the crazy ant has a fearsome reputation. It has devastated other tropical island ecosystems. The crazy ant is, a, is one of a small set of ants which has very, very special features which makes them very, very effective invaders. Now most ants have a single queen and each of these colonies is territorial. That is, they're territorial to other members of the same species. The crazy ant is not like that. In fact, they are multi-queened. They exchange members. So you get back and forth movement of workers and there's no, I've never seen aggression between workers in a given area. It's like a network of cities where there's continuous traffic uh, between them, a network of integrated cities, all working happily together. One of the most remarkable thing about these super colonies is it isn't like it's an area of five square meters, or 10 square meters, or a single hectare. These super colonies can extend for 50 hectares. Extraordinary numbers of ants. Uh, numbers of ants that I've, uh, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never seen ants at this density in my life. When you see something like that, when you see one single creature so dominate an ecosystem, we may not know exactly what the effects are, but uh, it would be hard to believe that the effects were not profound. Dennis estimates that up to 15 million crabs on the island have already been killed by ants. We can only speculate about how the ants kill the crabs. Most of us think about ants and we think about uh, bites and stings. This ant, uh, however, doesn't have a sting, but it has a potent chemical arsenal. This ant stores formic acid, and at the tip of its abdomen, it has a nozzle, and it's able to direct this nozzle so that when it encounters a prey item, it can spray it with formic acid. Now, formic acid is one of the most corrosive of acids. Despite their armor, the crabs are defenseless against the ants. They are most vulnerable as they migrate through the super colonies. Dave Slip is monitoring the impact of the spreading ant invasion on this year's crab migration. It's the crab's eyes that appear to suffer from the ant's acid first. Ultimately, uh, I think what happens is that they become blind. 
you can tell this if you wave your hand in front of a, a large crab sitting on the road, normally it'll run off. Some of these crabs will just freeze and you'll get absolutely no response, which suggests to me that they're quite blind. We're not entirely sure how the crabs are killed by the ants. It's starting to go a bit black on around the mouth there. We think that what happens is that the intense amount of acid that they spurt out over the body of the crabs, eventually it just becomes too much for the crabs. They're obviously the ones that end up dead. The crabs are most threatened if the ant supercolony spreads across their migration trail. They can't change their route because they're driven by instinct. Survival is a matter of luck. A week into the migration and the crab army marches straight into the island's economy. Christmas Island Phosphate is the largest industry on the island. Phosphate mining has supported the economy since the first human settlement in 1888. Today, it's still the principal employer of the 2,000 residents. There's now an energetic cultural mix of Malay, Chinese and Europeans, each with their own rituals and ceremonies. The company ships phosphate regularly to Southeast Asian markets hungry for fertilizer. In recent years, the mine and park managements have worked together to reduce crab deaths on the road. Kath Lynch is the environmental coordinator responsible for the mine's crab management plan. Happening as we can see by the roads. It's really, really important this year that we try or CIP tries. Our to workforce is made up predominantly of Chinese Malay workers. Um, we have, I think there's about five different languages. Can we do that? What do you think, Ricky? I think the awareness of the, the effect of the crazy ants and the actual implications that if we want what happens to the red crabs has really made people a lot more aware of their impact during red crab migration. The truck drivers are asked to observe the road and if there's a large migration in progress, we're to advise the supervisor. And where possible, we'll change our direction. It's a slightly longer route, but we don't lose a trip or a load out of it. Despite the precautions, researchers estimate that around one and a half million migrating crabs die on the roads every year. The roadkill brings out the robber crabs, the largest land crab in the world. Get hesitant to put my hands too close. Oh, come pal, up you go. Oh! Kath is also responsible for relocating the robbers away from the mine operations. Red crabs rarely attack each other, but they are scavengers. A little roadside cannibalism clears the carnage. After a first wave of males, female crabs have joined the mass migration. 
male. Female. Visiting ranger Gordon White has been honing his crab sexing techniques. Female. The hard part is uh, picking them up without getting nipped. The one that got away? The quickest way is to flip them with a stick. It takes a bit of practice, but it's, it's quick. It does hurt when they nip. Some of the little ones surprise Female. you. They're more agile than the older ones. I think only one drew blood, so it's not too bad. The way you spot it, that narrow triangle under his body, that's characteristic of the male. I'll show you a, a female. She's got this big broad tail, and it's broader because she uh, keeps the eggs tucked under that flap. We're two weeks into our infamous red crab migration and it's all happening down at Flying Fish Cove and the blowholes. Males are dipping in large numbers and heading back uh, to dig burrows and wait uh, for the females. But unfortunately the bad news is uh, Greta Beach is showing low numbers of crabs due to the crazy ant colonies. After two weeks of marching, the first wave of crabs finally reaches their goal the ocean. Now, at last, they can begin the next stage of their breeding ritual. The long, hazardous journey leaves the weary travellers dusty and dehydrated. They dip in the ocean to replace body fluids and salts. Without this, they could die. The species can't survive without this annual appointment with the sea, but they've adapted so much to the forest, the shoreline has become more dangerous. Moray eels are waiting to feast. The crabs may simply drown. They've adapted to breathe air, so their small gills can't provide enough oxygen underwater. Max sets out to investigate the numbers of crabs dipping off the steep limestone cliffs around the island. Yeah, good numbers along here, Max, as well. Yeah, they've really built up along this section. Um, a bit more than further back there. Are there many on the bottom, mate? Dipping from the steep cliffs can be hazardous. While they're expert climbers, some do perish. You know, they either fall off the cliff or are washed off the cliff by waves. And uh, while they can survive for some period underwater, quite a lot of them do drown. existence for the little fellas. On the way back, the rangers investigate a particular area. Yeah, well there's certainly uh, no crabs in this area. Nothing like that we were looking at before. And in years past, there are usually as many crabs here as what we saw previously down the the other part of the coast. The forest above this section of cliff is one of the largest crazy ant super colonies on the island. Yeah, it looks like the ants have had their effect, I think. Mom. The fact that there are no crabs here at all is a very grim sign. 
Even in the most remote parts of the island, researchers are still finding ant supercolonies. They can spread fast, up to three meters in a single day. Hidden Valley is an extraordinary place. It takes a little more effort to get there because it's not on a track, but the reward used to be worth it. Everywhere we walked, there were very, very high densities of ants, and uh, we stopped still for less than a minute, and the ants would be up our legs. When I saw that, I thought, well, this is pretty serious, and I, I couldn't imagine anything else living in amongst these ants. As you march through an entire valley, I mean, it's a valley of ants. Crabs just fall over once they hit those areas. It's a bit like running into a wall. It stops them in their tracks. Big male. It's probably like um, a mustard gas attack. This was not long for the world. He's still with us, but just. Oh. Let's try some litmus on him. By using litmus paper, the scientists can clearly see evidence of formic acid on the dying crab. The mouth parts tend to start, they become a little bit black. They tend to bubble from the mouth as well. I'm sure it's a horrible way for them to die. To the ants, the crab is an invader, and when overcome, is just food. I find this whole event uh, depressing. I'm, I'm a scientist, uh, I like to remain uh, neutral, detached, that's how I'm trained to do, but no one no one uh, who uh, has looked at the natural history of the island and come to know it can remain detached from these kinds of events. It's impossible. But it's not just red crabs that have disappeared from the valley. The Hidden Valley used to be quite a, a big area for robber crab. The robber crabs would go down there to molt Christmas Island is home to the largest population of robber crabs in the world. They are under threat elsewhere because they're good to eat and they've been hunted to near extinction. They're sometimes called coconut crabs because of their ability to break open coconuts with their huge nippers. But even this enormous crustacean is no match for the ant invasion. It's just incredibly sad, particularly when you're seeing these big old robber crabs that are obviously probably as old as I am. And, you know, when you see them, they hit this, the, the ant colonies and they're obviously in some sort of distress. I think it's just incredibly sad to see that sort of thing happening. Down near the shoreline, freshly dipped crabs are moving back from the beaches and cliffs to the nearest forest. They're looking for a place to set up a temporary home. Some stragglers are still navigating their way to the sea. Crabs pop up in the most unexpected places. Don't even think of eating them. They're apparently inedible. They're good intruders. If you leave the front door open and the back door open, the crabs on their migration, whether they're going down to the coast or walking back, they'll just come and go straight through. They won't wait. Unless they've got a clear route through and the cat doesn't ambush them on the way, they're fine. They're part of the furniture. Even the most adventurous stragglers are racing against time. The moon urges them relentlessly seawards to meet with the right tide.
On the terraces just back from the shoreline, the island's most driven excavators are at work. Crabs are expert burrowers, but now it's males only who dig the large burrows in which they hope to mate before returning home to the forest. Space near the shoreline is at a premium, and millions of crabs are competing for the chance to entice the females into a burrow. Brawls are inevitable. In the rainforest, the detective work continues. The ants have only recently formed super colonies, and the scientists want to know why. I believe a key to this whole super colony formation, uh, invasion and impact, is uh, really an extraordinary relationship between the crazy ant and scale insects. Uh, but scale density is so high here that they just form a sheath around the, around the stem. Now ants, and the crazy ant among them, are well known to tend aphids and scale insects. Scale insects are sap suckers, and they excrete honeydew, a sugar solution. Now the ants collect the honeydew, which is basically sugar water. It's a carbohydrate supply for the worker ants. And in most situations, in return, the ants protect the scale insects from their enemies. Now in these circumstances, scale populations can skyrocket. And the leaves on the stem are, are gone, and, and these, uh, these seedlings are really looking scrappy. When the scale booms, uh, crazy ant populations increase. They have more food resources. When the crazy ant populations increase, the kinds of effects where crabs are killed by crazy ants uh, are set in train. After decades of lying low, the sudden boom in ant numbers is puzzling. It could be as simple as people uh, not noticing the invasion, but it could be much more complex than that. The boom and scale insects may be related to changes in the quality of the sap that they feed on. The sap changes when the trees are stressed during prolonged dry seasons. The scale numbers build up and the ants pamper them. This in turn is affecting the forest canopy. The scale is sucking so much sap that entire trees are damaged. Parts of the canopy are dying. But the fallout from the invasion doesn't stop there. Red crab's feeding habits play a crucial role in shaping the Christmas Island rainforest. Most rainforests are thick with vines and growing trees. By eating almost everything they find on the forest floor, the crabs have created a rainforest with a dense canopy above an open understory. But where crabs have been killed by crazy ants, the seedlings they once ate have established themselves and now thrive. In the early stages of the invasion, the seedlings were very, very small. Now, many of these seedlings I wouldn't even call seedlings anymore, I'd call them saplings. And they're now over your head. You have to move, sometimes with great difficulty, through this understory of saplings, which can be fairly uncomfortable because some of these species are those which uh, have some pretty nasty characteristics. There are two species of stinging trees in the forest, which you rarely see, except in areas of supercolony formation by the crazy ants. As crazy ants tend scale high up in the canopy, they encounter other potential victims. We have no direct evidence at this point that uh, crazy ants uh, affect reproduction in the canopy of, of seabirds, but all I can say is that when you walk into these areas where super colonies have formed, typically it's silent.
The seabirds range far across the ocean, but they still depend on land. Some rare species breed only on this one island. The Christmas frigate bird is the world's rarest frigate bird. The beautiful golden bosun bird. It nests in holes in cliffs and trees, and sometimes unafraid, even at the foot of trees. The abbot's booby, the rarest and largest of all the boobies, nests in the tallest trees. It breeds only on Christmas Island, where forest clearing by the mine operation has further reduced populations. The juvenile abbot's booby spends its days strengthening its wings. The adult birds are gliders, superbly adapted to catch updrafts from the ocean's surface. They depend on tall trees to nest because they can't take off from the ground. The parents feed the nestling for up to a year. The longer the chick spends in the nest, the more vulnerable it becomes to crazy ants moving up into the canopy. Already there is some evidence of ant attack on birds. We've had a couple of birds brought into us that have obviously suffered as a consequence of the ant invasion. Again, it seems to be the eyes that are the most vulnerable part of the bird. As caretaker of the island's wildlife, Max looks after orphaned and injured birds. They're all young birds and they probably haven't been able to fend for themselves in the wild. Max's wife, Bev, also helps with the bird care. When they bring birds in, the first thing to look for is see if their wings are broken or any other damage, like um, they might have been attacked by other birds. Most disgruntled. <laughs> The brown boobies are real rat bags. They can be quite aggressive, I guess it's because they nest on the ground and it's been built into their system to be a bit more aggressive to protect themselves and their nests. The convalescing birds are living in booby heaven. take them to a stage whereby they can return to the wild. You're listening to VLU2. This is your Christmas Island crab migration report. It's all happening, uh, apparently, at the lower terraces. Uh, crab mating has begun. The 
Bird mating is usually conducted underground, in the burrows dug by males. Often, the demand for burrows exceeds supply, and crabs will mate outside. This can attract unwanted attention, especially from young males new to this complicated routine. Usually, mating takes place with the male on his back and the female on top. The young males appear to experiment with positions, often completely missing the point. The sperm is transferred from the male into the female's abdomen, fertilizing the eggs she'll hold in a brood pouch. Each female retires to a burrow to incubate the eggs. Now they wait for the gentle neap tide, which occurs during the last quarter of the moon. Max continues his search for ant damage. This beach in particular has him worried. Well, Greta Beach has traditionally been the spot to go and watch the spawning because of the sheer number of crabs that used to spawn at that particular site. Now, the crabs that were usually resident above Greta Beach have been wiped out by the ants. It's an area that's just littered with dead crabs. And, I mean, the stench there can be quite overwhelming at times. Each day, debris from Southeast Asia is concentrated and dumped on Greta Beach by the sea. In the same way, the original crab ancestors may have washed ashore here and colonised the island. They still depend, even today, on the same action of the sea. The females re-emerge from their mating burrows when the eggs have developed. A big mother may carry up to a hundred thousand eggs. It's been 12 days now since the crabs mated. Tomorrow, the females will begin to mass. In tune with their synchronized biological clocks, the egg-laden females flood towards the shoreline. They hunker down in the shade and wait for night to come. Here on Ethel Beach, they are still unaffected by crazy ant super colonies. This is the only time of the year the crabs make a sound. Collectively, they squeak like the cries of young birds. Even completely upside down, they still carry a full bundle of eggs. They have plenty of practice. A big female may be up to 20 years old. This female has lost her spawn package. The frothing at the mouth shows extreme stress. She may die. Down in the kampong by the sea, 
the Malay drummers beat out the rhythms of celebration. spawn. The spawning is spectacular because you can see the culmination of weeks of activity, the long migration by the males, then the females, and the burrowing and the mating. And at last, the females are coming down, packed with eggs, releasing into the water in the darkness with that little uh, moon in the distance. It's spectacular. I find it great the fact that these crabs have made it after all they've gone through to get there to do this. Some of them would have walked up to seven kilometres to get to the place where they're spawned. They seem to do it with great glee too. It's really something to see. Crab's ritual dance is more than a moment of triumph. As they raise their claws and shake their body, they expel the eggs from their brood pouches. It usually takes two or three attempts to clear the fertilized eggs. Frequently, the females lose their footing. Many drown. The eggs hatch immediately on contact with the water. The billions upon billions of larvae stain the water brown. As dawn breaks, a few stragglers make a last dash to the water's edge. Many crabs have arrived too late, so they'll mass again tonight. Those who made the main event will join the males on their return to the forest. Max goes to check his favorite Greta Beach. As he expects, the number of spawning crabs is greatly reduced. 
One crab, stranded on the beach, is confused. She has come so far to face defeat. She's obviously blind and uh, as a result of the ants up above here, she doesn't know where she is and uh, I think she's just literally given up. So she thought, well, I guess I can eat these eggs I'm carrying, I suppose. The tide of freshly hatched larvae billows out to sea, where it will drift on the currents for up to a month. The developing larvae are at the mercy of wind, tides and marine predators. Five days later, a cyclone passes close to Christmas Island. The storm is close enough to cause severe damage. Huge seas disperse the red crab larvae off the track of the currents. Often, the larvae don't return at all. This year, the sea and the ants together could decimate the crab population. But the island experts are taking action. Ant poisons are being trialled in the worst of the super colonies. I, I think the possibility of eradicating the ant on the island is, uh, is very, very difficult. There may be glimmers of hope in that it may be possible to contain the ant. Or the ant uh, uh, has its own rhythm, its own uh, population cycles. But the difficulty is, is how long is it between the low point of the cycle and the high point of the cycle? There's so much more to know. I guess the problem lies with us as uh, managers of the, the ecosystems here on the island. This year, the cyclone took its toll there was no return of baby crabs from the mass spawning. But one month later, there was another small spawning event. Several weeks after that, Max was able to film a red rug of baby crabs as they crossed their first road. They were navigating their way into the rainforest and the ants. How many survived? He doesn't know. It's difficult to predict how far crazy ants will spread across the island. Maybe there is some natural limit that will create a new balance between the species, so crabs and ants can exist together. The future could be bleak, but red crabs are resilient. Only time will tell whether they will continue their remarkable march once a year to dance until dawn.